Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. For many of us, among the most important relationships that we have are those that we, in these days, call family relations, or relations to those who we see as related to us. Uh, oftentimes we talk in terms of blood or genetic relationships, but we might also well think about adoptive relationships and how those function as well. Aristotle doesn't leave this out. In fact, he thinks that it's quite important to talk about this within the framework of friendships or filii. And he's, he's interested in, in, in one part of Nicomachean Ethics Book 6 in talking about how affection, and he uses two terms uh, fairly you know, synonymously there, both of which are verbs, standard gain, which means to feel sort of a familial affection. Uh, later on, Storgia is going gonna, is gonna to be formed out of that. Um, which gets associated with one kind of love later on. Feeling, uh, you know, the, the verb, uh, also time, the, the, the middle or, or passive verb, for feeling uh, friendship, feeling affection, uh, all of that. How does that happen? What are the bases for that within these familial relations? Aristotle discusses this in part because he's interested in how this works, but he's also looking at what should be going on within a family. So we might think in terms of this is providing us with an idealized model, um, but also you know, giving us some scope for thinking about how things sometimes go wrong. Parents, uh, he says, feel this naturally for their children, and he, he doesn't go very far in his discussion of this. He says that they feel uh, affection for their children, for their offspring, as essentially part of themselves. We, we often say that, you know, somebody who's a child resembles their mother or their father, or you, you can see so much of their, their you know, child, and so much of the parent in the child, uh, you know, we can go on and on. And so when you're actually the parent and you can see some of those traits, that might help to uh, produce the, the affection. You know that the child is actually from you, Aristotle says, at least the mother does. <laughs> This is a common concern for the ancient Greeks before paternity tests became readily available. Um, you know, there is an old saying that only the mother can know that, that she is actually the, uh, the parent. Um, and so Aristotle says this is why mothers actually love their children more than fathers do, which is a little bit suspect. But he says that um, they, uh, you know, they're, they're more attached to their, their, their progeny than the progeny to, to them because um, that which springs from a thing belongs to the thing from which it springs. He also says that parents um, love their children longer than the children love them in, in duration. Why? Because the parent begins to feel this immediately after the child is born. And the child, when they're first born, I mean, you, if any of you have seen babies, when they're newly born, they're, they don't know much of anything. And so Aristotle says, until the child has developed some degree of understanding, or at least, you know, uh, perception, they don't really uh, understand the parent as, as parent. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. So he says, parents love their children as, as themselves, one's offspring being, as it were, another self. And this is where this notion of friendship as, as being about another self comes in. Now you could say, well, what about when the child begins to develop a personality of his or her own? Uh, you know, when the child becomes, uh, you know, mature and, and develops uh, their own individuality that is no longer entirely dependent on that of the parent. Um, Aristotle doesn't tell us much about that, but we can imagine that would work along similar lines as with other friendships. And some of the things that we're seeing here 
with the other discussions would fit in there. Parents and children have spent a lot of time together, so that also allows for the, that bond of affection to grow between them. Um, you know, he doesn't talk about the fact that parents might also be driven nuts and, and dislike their children because the, their children do resemble them, and because their children do come from them. Um, if you have bad character traits, you know, sort of, let's say, inattentiveness or a lack of common sense, and now you see that in your child, you might dislike seeing that in your child, and if you're not very emotionally mature, you might dislike your child because of what you dislike in yourself. Children pick up a lot of habits from us, and they are, in many respects, you know, reflections. Uh, of ourselves. So if we don't really like ourselves, if there's traits about us that we don't like that our children pick up on, that can be a problem. Let's go on to talk about children. Aristotle says children feel this, this feeling of affection towards their parents as being the source of their, their being, as having been what brought them into being. And this is a very typical ancient, not only Greek, but also Roman, uh, many ancient cultures have this sort of view. Uh, the, the parent is in a certain way analogous to, like I put here, the gods, the divine, because the parents provide what makes <clears throat> existence possible for the child. First of all, bringing the child into being, and then sustaining the child in being uh, as the child is, is growing. And sometimes this goes on quite, quite a long time. So, um, you know, the, the, the children, you know, whether their parents really are good or superior to them, the children will often look at their parents as being something like divine figures with, uh, you know, being superior, being good, being what the, the image of the good is. This is also why it's so important when you're parenting to be a good person because otherwise you can really screw your kids up by giving them the wrong example because of this, this, this affection. The affection can, can work to make the kids think that the, the wrong things are right. In any case, he, he, he says, um, the, the parents have bestowed on, on children the greatest benefits in being the cause of their existence and their rearing and later of their education. So he says, another important point of this, the friendship between parents and children affords a greater degree both of pleasure and of utility or usefulness than of persons unrelated to each other, inasmuch as they have much in common in their lives. So by living within the same household, you know, just think about <clears throat> the function of chores, for example, right? At a certain point, your kids can take the trash out, and now you don't have to do the trash. And that is so nice, because up until that point, not only have you been watching the kids and doing all the things necessary, and perhaps even earning an income to take care of the kids, and shuttling them here and there, you're also doing all the household chores. When your kids become old enough to actually do the chores, and not just do them, but do them correctly, <laughs> so that you don't have to clean up after them, Suddenly, you know, they have become useful for you. You've been useful for them the entire time. Now they've become useful for you. And there's that, that, that level. There's lots of ways in which we derive pleasure in the parent-child relationship as well. You know, um, think about things as simple as when the infant is there playing peekaboo. Kids love that, right? And, and parents kind of like that too, I think. Um, but there's many other ways. You know, spending time together, the sort of things that parents, good parents often do with their children, like reading together, going fishing, going on trips, uh, you know, provided that, you, you know, you don't have meltdowns or things like that. Um, the things that we talk about is building good memories, right? Well, those don't just build good memories. Those build off of that, that affection and deepen it and widen it. So that now philia encompasses something more than just, hey, I'm the one who brought you into this world. Let's talk about siblings now. So siblings also feel this for each other, and the original basis of this is that they are coming from the same being. So Aristotle thinks that, you know, stepchildren, for example, or children who are adopted from different families will not have that original uh, bond of connection with each other. Of course, they might if they think that they're actually from the same parents and they're not told about that. But then, over time, there's other factors that enter in as well. Like, you know, the, the, the rearing, the education, the common experiences. He, he actually has a great discussion here about virtue. He says, um, 
uh, friendship between brothers has the same characteristics as members of a comradeship, and he has them in a greater degree, provided they are virtuous, provided they are, um, you know, decent people, um, uh, you know, that they are morally serious, we might say, that they have something that we can look up to. And he goes on and he says, inasmuch as children uh, of the same parents who have been brought up together and educated alike are more alike in character, more alike in their basic assumptions, more alike in the way that they live together, provided they haven't been brought up in a bad way, um, they will naturally incline to each other. They will naturally feel a greater degree of affection towards, the, to, towards each other than they will towards outsiders or even members of groups that they, they belong to. So he says, uh, also with brothers, the test of time has been the longest and most reliable. Um, you remember that the highest form of friendship for Aristotle requires that you have spent a lot of time with that person. You can already have put that time in with your sibling at the times when you were actually most vulnerable to being a screw-up, that is, youth and adolescence and, and perhaps early 20s, right? And if you make it through that, you have this, this huge stock of experience. You know, somebody might, might say, um, you don't really know me, but if you grew up with them, you probably do know them pretty well if you've been observed. One other thing that I didn't put on the board, Aristotle says that, that relations with other family members who are not so closely connected, like cousins, are really analogous to, to these sorts of relations. They're just not as, as strong. Um, they have to do with coming from a common stem, uh, but then also how often you interact is, is important as well. So somebody might have, first, for instance, in my family, first cousins are really much more similar to what other people have as brothers and sisters. Uh, third cousins are much more like what other people uh, in today's society have as first cousins. We're, we're a sort of older family in, in that sense, uh, and we also make an effort to, to stick together and stay in touch. Other families don't necessarily have that. You might be first cousins with somebody and you don't know them from Adam. You don't really feel any sense of affection towards them. So that, that's important to keep in mind. The last one we want to talk about, uh, very important, husband and wife. Aristotle says that um, the, the, the mating instinct uh, originally brings people together, man, woman, right? Uh, he's not worried about you know, other possible relations. He's keeping things very basic here. Um, you know, reproduction generally took place, as far as we know. There may have been an exception. I don't actually know if there ever has been, but it's taken place primarily. Man, woman, getting together. Getting together because of a sexual attraction that Aristotle says is natural. We observe this not only in human beings, but in many other animals as well. So he says the friendship, the, the philia, between husband and wife appears to be a natural instinct because human beings are by nature a pairing creature. This is even more very uh, uh, interesting. Even more than he is a political creature. Now Aristotle says that human beings are by nature political or social creatures. Here he's saying even more than that, we are pairing creatures. We are creatures that are looking, and he doesn't just think it's about getting laid, uh, about getting your rocks off or something like that. That has a, a role in it, but he thinks that we're, we're looking for something more than that. So he goes on and he says, um, Whereas other, with the other animals, the association of the sexes aims only at continuing the species. Human beings cohabit stay together, not only for the sake of beginning children, but also to provide for the needs of life. It is a relationship in which both partners get something out of it. So like I put a common life together. Um, he says, with the human race, division of labor begins, and man and woman have different functions. They supply each other's wants, putting their special capacities into the common stock. Now, this is rather idealized. I'm not saying that Aristotle is right about this in thinking that every relationship goes this way, whether in the present or in Aristotle's time or in the you know, prehistoric past. I think we can think of a lot of exploitive and unfair relationships. But Aristotle is saying that when affection is arising, it is arising 
in part because of whatever measure of, of you know, fairness or equality, of putting things into the common stock is involved, he thinks that is, is part of what cements the relationship of, of friendship and, and affection between spouses, between people who are, are staying together. He goes on and he says, the friendship of man and wife seems to be one of utility and pleasure combined. By the way, Aristotle doesn't think that, that friendships of utility and friendships of pleasure very often combine. They do combine here in the marriage or spousal relationship. Um, so that's very interesting. He goes on, though, and he mentions another possibility. He says, it may also be based on virtue if the, par if the partners be of high moral character. For either sex has its special virtue, and this may be the ground of attraction. It may be that some romantic relationships, and they're going to be pretty rare, are in fact relations of people who are virtuous with each other. And then he says, um, children too seem to be a bond of union. Therefore, childless marriages are more easily dissolved. Children are a good possessed by both parents in common, and common property holds people together. Uh, children help to, you might say, expand and consolidate the affection already felt in the relationship between the, the woman and the man, the, the wife and the husband in the relationship. So what we have here is uh, a whole, you know, uh, you might say economy within the household for the circulation of the affection that is important with friendship. Again, Aristotle uh, is not actually claiming that this is the case in every single family. As a matter of fact, we know that's not actually the, the case, perhaps from our own uh, bad experiences or from seeing other people who we know, or at least watching Lifetime movies. <laughs> uh, but it, this, this does provide us with a, a great model and a way for understanding how affection is supposed to arise what its bases are, and then how these different relationships are connected with each other.